thank you, Howard. And uh, this is going to be perhaps slightly different from the abstract and slightly different from what it was earlier on. Um, well, I hope you're going to reflect, actually, a lot of what's already been said, uh, particularly building on, on what Melanie said and, to some extent, what Andrew said, and what might be about to be said by, by Darrell. I, don't, I can't preempt that, necessarily. Um, I want to talk less about Offers of Dyke and more about the landscape which, to some extent, it has created. I think we need to apply some of the thinking on borders, borderlands and frontiers, as Mel Melanie uh, mentioned, from other disciplines in the social sciences, and also um, to use our archaeological voices to make the modern world a better place. And to that end, this is more, this paper is very much a, a call to arms uh, rather than a, a nuanced theoretical exposition. So I, I, I apologise for that. Well, actually, I don't apologise for that. I'm just going to carry on. Um, uh, and first, in fact, in that uh, vein, um, just to whet your uh, political taste buds, uh, since Offa was a Christian and part of his mission, as he saw it, was to build a Western stronghold within a broader pan-European Christendom, and as it's nearly Christmas, I thought I'd show you a seasonal picture of the Holy Land. So I shall come back to some of the questions that this raises later on. But let's turn back from actual Jerusalem today and look at Blake's New Jerusalem. That's green and pleasant land. And yes, this is England, the beautiful county of Shropshire, with so many Welsh place names, of which this, Lambeth Hill, is one. And here we see, here we see the dyke demarcating the limits of Mercia, gracefully and seductively crossing and balancing the contours. So I want to talk about four things. Um, firstly, what was the dyke intended to do, and how was it designed to enable it to do that? Uh, secondly, what did it actually do, uh, what were the actual consequences of its construction, and what lessons can we draw from that today? Thirdly, how might we situate this in the context of borderland theory and other disciplines that are actually engaging with the world around us? And fourthly, why is the theoretically informed archaeological study of Offen's Dyke relevant or interesting? And indeed, how can it be useful in making the world a better place? Of course, all this does assume, rather, that Offer's Dyke was indeed built by Offer, or at least under his direction, which it probably was, but this, as our Scottish legal friends would say, is not proven. Um, Fox established that it was post-Roman, as here as excavations at Treath, um, with Roman pottery in the bank. Um, and Paul Everson established that it predated a medieval uh, field system at uh, Dustin Fields in the Vale of Montgomery. Um, we have established um, that it could have been 6th or 10th century which perhaps wasn't very helpful. Um, but let's assume it was built by Offer. Uh, Keith, uh, as Cyril Fox before him, has made some convincing arguments that it was the work of a single mind, or at least a single mindset, and was cunningly engineered to provide maximum visibility and effect. So what was Offer's Dyke intended to do? Well, its form and the manner of its construction suggests that it was designed to at least evoke fortification. It maximises visual domination of the landscape. It does this to exert some sort of control on people who lived on the west side of the dyke or who were approaching the dyke from that direction. Keith, again, I will sing his praises, has suggested an ad adjusted segmented mode of construction, which you can actually see very clearly in this slide, uh, but in case you can't, I've highlighted it with some red lines, in which certain key points, um, the dyke is built in a series of segments, uh, each 50 metres or so long, uh, which don't form a straight line, but they're slightly at angles. And this allows, in, in Keith's uh, uh, thesis, the dyke to present its most impressive face to particular targets in the landscape to the west. Now, <coughs> Keith and I do disagree on what those targets may have been, but that, that's for another day. But I, I think we can, we can take this as, as, a, as, a, as a sensible interpretation of the form of the dyke. Another tactically clever design feature is the way in which the dyke often runs along the hill below the ridge, affording maximum visibility. And you can't really see it very clearly, but there, there is the dyke running across there. Too late, Colin. Um, in essence, it aligns itself westwards on the downslopes and outwards on the upslopes. So the westward deviation on the hills enhances the impact of the dyke on views from the uplands to the west, and the eastwards deviation in the valleys increases the dominance of the dyke over the valley bottom. These two effects would be mutually reinforcing. This suggests that the design of the dyke was motivated by the need to overlook routes or potential routes through the landscape 
and its placement was intended to impress people moving as much as it was aimed at particular static targets or locations, as I said earlier. The question of, a, of the dike as a feature that controlled movement in the landscape um, underpins a long-standing debate, which I'm not going to go into here, about the extent to which the original design included gaps or gateways for traffic, as opposed to gaps for natural watercourses. If control of movement is a key purpose, then it seems logical there would have been gates to regulate access. Um, and there is a variety of place name evidence that's already been discussed, Wolf being one of them, um, which might support this hypothesis. Um, and again, I, I urge you to read Keith's book because it uh, it's goes into this in some detail. But obviously what we do need to do is some actual field work. We need some, to dig some bloody great holes in the, in the thing, really. Hergen here is an obvious example of a, of a, of a very likely gateway. Um, it's very interesting how people have come across this <coughs> feature, but you see a very exaggerated form of the, of the dike here with almost a double, a double bank, uh, a more conventional form here, but it turns at a right angle and there's a gap here. And this point, Hergen is actually located on a watershed. Um, and I think, I can't remember who it was that mentioned watersheds as being possible, maybe that was Andrew actually, as being possible lines of, of key routes. Um, uh, so, although the dike is quasi-military in form, it's not really, uh, it doesn't really have a role with the fortification. An analysis of the dike has primarily looked at views from the West and the relationship between Mercia and what might be termed not Mercia. An alternative way of considering the dike is from within Mercia itself, both in direct terms of its role in uniting a potentially divided polity and in the creation of a distinct landscape at the edge of that polity, which many people have spoken about already. And <coughs> it, it goes back to um, earlier paper. Variously, wildly disparate uh, estimates have been made about how many person days it would have taken to build the dike. Um, but the point really is that the building of the dike could have been undertaken within the well-established traditions of labour service in Saxon England, even if the project as a whole was overseen by what Fox envisaged as a school of engineers. By engaging local labour, the Mercian state was therefore able to assert both its ownership of the project and of the landscape, and the cohesiveness of its political and administrative systems. So, hashtag MMGA there. Such grand projects were ideologically important to an emerging nation state such as Mercia. They are an essential component in manufacturing the identity of the king and his kingdom, as Gleese stated earlier. In developing such identities, early medieval rulers were well aware of Roman antecedents, and in particular their ability to construct linear barriers in difficult terrain. However, the construction of Offa's Dyke, and I'm, I'm always amused by this um, photograph, was more than a short-term Mercian team-building exercise. So I shall come to my third and second points, perhaps not in that order. What actually happened? What lessons can we draw from that today? And how might this be situated in the context of borderland theory and other disciplines that are actually engaging with the world around us? Um, the existence of the dike not only shaped its builders and those on the other side, but also generated new relations between the two. Offa's dike was constructed as part of the creation of Mercia, and the creation of Mercia was achieved by positioning it in opposition to something else, in this case, the emergent kingdom of Paris. Although this relationship might have been more or less hostile in reality, um, it was important for each to maintain the perception of hostility from the other in order to justify the existence and strengthening of the elites which controlled them. And to do this, it was necessary for certain groups to be able to cross the dike. Um, Regulation of this movement to a greater or lesser extent may have been desirable, but stopping it altogether would not have been. As we've seen, the dike was certainly able to regulate movement and perhaps even can exert control of the direction and scale of movement at particular places, but it was not intended as an impermeable barrier. It was also very short-lived, at least in political and administrative terms, even if it retained last, longer-lasting social and cultural significance. In contemporary landscapes, it has been argued that borders and border monuments could be viewed less as markers of division and more as mechanisms of connectivity and encounter. And to some extent, this reflects what Richard was saying earlier about borders as routes. However, anyone like me who's walked off his diet will know that it crosses the grain of the land and is not a natural routeway in many parts of its um, course. Borders are themselves liminal spaces, providing channels or conduits of passage. Indeed, they often facilitate the creation of particular cross-border networks by enabling discrimination between those who can and cannot cross. 
that this long-term permeability was perhaps one of the original motiva motivations in the design of the earthwork <coughs> is borne out by the later history of Offa's Dyke. Mm. This is to some extent reflected in the 1836 boundary, which you can see here in red, another map from Fox, which obviously doesn't, this is the fixing of the boundary in Wales, the uh, uh, Laws in Wales Acts of 1536 and 1542, of course. Um, it doesn't have very little to do with Offa's Dyke. There were, of course, considerable and well-established pockets of English settlement to the west of the dyke and of Welsh settlement to the east of the dyke, and in some cases well to the east <coughs> of the present border. There were frequent marriages between aristocratic and gentry families on both sides of the border, with neither side having a consistent domination over the other. And this could be understood in borderland theory terms as a process of creolisation, um, which is defined as the formation of new cultural constructs for offspring of inter-ethnic mar inter marriage. And the resulting cultural, cultural construct in this case was in fact a borderland, and a borderland defined by Chris Romsford as an area which is administratively and politically connected, connected to one polity, but which comes under strong economic, cultural and demographic influence from another. The borderland itself then becomes a resource which can be accessed by people on both sides, resulting in what Christoph Sohn as described as a process of placemaking that transcends the border. The extent to which this was an intended or unintended consequence of the construction of the dike remains an open question, but I suggest that it was intended and intended it was intended to be a consequence. So even though it's politically short-lived, the dike has longer-lasting social and cultural significance. This is the role that has remained important as a network-like interface enabling the construction and communication of socio-spatial differences. In this sense, the real legacy of the construction of Offa's Dyke was not a hard military border, but the creation of a softer, culturally distinct borderland, a physical and cultural landscape, which is still with us today. In the event this did not benefit the Kingdom of Mercia, which didn't last much longer really, but it did generate a distinctive cultural and physical landscape which influenced political and social change for the next thousand years. So to turn to my final point, why is a theoretically informed archaeological study of Offa's Dyke relevant or interesting and how can it be useful in making the world a better place? And some of the pictures here might be a bit political, but I don't care. It's Friday. It's Monday. Tuesday. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> As has been, uh, it's been a long week already. Uh, as has already been mentioned, borders are very topical. Howard mentioned this at the very beginning, and many other speakers through the day have alluded to the question of borders that surround our engagement with the modern world today. There is a populist crisis, a populist response, sorry, to crisis in the world, which is very disturbing. It talks in lots of languages, not just English, about how to control freedom of movement. In so doing, in places, it also seeks to control freedom of expression and other freedoms. Archaeology, as Melanie noted, has a great depth of understanding of many of these things, these processes, both in terms of long time, which is the theme of this conference, and in recognising nuances. I think we can contribute, and we need to be louder and more articulate, as well as being true to our own discipline, as Melanie pointed out. Borders can be places of contestation, but as the later history of the borderland which the dyke created suggests that although there's a lot of what Rachel Pope, who isn't with us today, uh, might call, and has called, willy-waving uh, up and down the border uh, until the 16th century, ordinary people were able to live on both sides and cross between the border uh, peacefully and even prosperously. Some walls are more toxic than others, of course. And some walls only exist in the mind, and some are based on fear and not facts. But I want to end positively, so I'll move on from that picture. <laughs> we are lucky. Um, the experience of those of us who have lived and worked in the very precious thing that is the Schengen area is rather like my own daily experience of borderlands. This is, this is my train. This is how I get from Shrewsbury in England, where I live, to my office in Welshpool, which is in Wales. And it takes about 20 minutes. And it's lovely. There are no passport controls or customs checks or currency changes. The Englishness of one side of the border is respected as much as the Welshness of the other side. But in between, there's a unique space. And I hope that as archaeologists, we can help save that unique space that we have enjoyed for most of my lifetime, free of physical and intellectual boundaries. 
a nuanced understanding of Offa's Dyke, not as a frontier or a border, but as a formative influence on the creation of socio-cultural networks would, I think, be a good place to start. Thank you.